So we applied our uh, approach to a data set of sequences we gathered from uh, a bunch of different African populations. We found evidence for several intergressive haplotypes in different parts of Africa, but the frequencies of the intergressive part, uh, haplotypes were highest in the population, the pygmy populations from Central Africa. Using extensive computer simulations, we first showed that the data were not consistent with a model of no admixture at all. So we rejected the null model of no admixture. And using a likelihood approach, we were able to make inferences about the model that involved introgression. In particular, uh, contemporary African populations seem to contain about 2% uh, contribution of genetic material from an archaic form um, that introgressed approximately 35 to 40,000 years ago from a group that split perhaps as long ago as 700,000 years. And the dis given the distribution of these different fragments, we suggested that the interbreeding may have been centered somewhere in Central Africa. Now, I just want to digress for one second here about a very interesting story that came up this year that involved the Y chromosome. And that is the discovery of a very rare and ancient Y chromosome that didn't fit into the known picture of Y chromosome diversity. Many, many years of research on the Y chromosome told us it was very much like mitochondrial DNA. All the Y chromosome variation today trace back to a very recent single ancestor that lived in Africa about 100 to 140,000 years ago. This was, the, this was the picture that we had at the time, and it made a lot of sense because the most divergent lineages on the Y tree were found in hunter-gatherer populations like the Khoisan and the Pygmies, which was very similar to autosomal patterns. Well, this particular lineage which was discovered in a, an African-American man from South Carolina who happened to submit this DNA to uh, the National Geographic Genographic Project, which sees thousands and thousands of samples, was very unusual, did not fit on the tree. Well, so just to update where we stand today, now we have to add another admixture process in, in Africa along with the two outside of Africa. When we discuss the origins of modern humans, the term out of Africa is a bit misleading. Our common ancestors came not from Africa as a whole but from a relatively small area somewhere in East Africa. Beginning around 80,000 years ago, this area was the scene of several population expansions that culminated in a Big Bang circa 60,000 BP. This was a sustained expansion that pushed out of Africa and into Europe, Asia, Oceania, and the Americas. These modern humans spread at the expense of more archaic hominins, Neanderthals in Europe and West Asia, and other poorly known groups elsewhere. But the latter were not totally replaced. As seen in the 1-4% to Neanderthal admixture of present-day Europeans, East Asians, and Papuans. This has led some people to quip that only Africans are pure Homo sapiens. Better yet, and a blow to Caucasian and Asian racists, the comparison of the human and Neanderthal genome makes it clear that it is only Africans who are 100% Homo sapiens, while in European, including American and Australian settlers and Asian populations one can find up to 4% DNA stemming from the archaic and often maligned Neanderthal species, a hominid that went extinct more than 20,000 years ago. Well, no. Sub-Saharan Africans actually have more archaic admixture. The difference is that it came not from Neanderthals but from archaic groups within Africa. About 13% of the sub-Saharan gene pool comes from an earlier expansion of pre-modern hominins that occurred circa 111,000 years ago and seems to correspond to the entry of skull calves hominins into the Middle East. This higher level of admixture may have come about because archaic Africans were behaviorally and physically closer to modern humans than the Neanderthals were. Nonetheless, these Paleo-Africans were clearly archaic. They lacked something that modern humans had. What was this disadvantage that ultimately removed them from the struggle for existence? The answer is much debated, but most authors posit a limited capacity for symbolic thinking and social organization. The African exodus was predated by a cultural revolution involving new stone blade technologies, skin working tools, ornaments and imported red ochre. More advanced symbolic systems in language and religious beliefs could have provided a competitive advantage to a group by promoting coordination and cohesion. Thus, 
When we discuss human origins, the real split was not between Africans and non-Africans but rather between two groups of Africans, archaics and moderns. Dinox, 2005, uses the terms Paleo-Africans and Afrasians. It is common to distinguish between Africans and non-Africans, with the former being much more genetically diverse than the latter. But, the real gap in human origins seems to be between the really old Africans, Paleo-Africans. And the rest, Afrasians. All of this leads to an intriguing conclusion. Since present-day Sub-Saharan Africans were used as a benchmark to estimate Neanderthal admixture in present-day Eurasians, and since Paleo-African gene sequences should be less derived, and more similar to Neanderthal gene sequences, Neanderthal admixture in present-day Eurasians is probably a bit higher than the estimated 1-4%. to 4%.